Hello, and welcome to the CME module, Persistent Lyme Disease. The learning objectives are listed here. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Maloney. I developed and narrate this module. I have no financial conflicts to disclose. I will be discussing the off-label use of antibiotics. Here's a case discussion to illustrate the main concepts I want you to consider. This 50-year-old gentleman presents with a recent history of Lyme disease and ongoing symptoms. His original diagnosis was based on the presence of an erythema migrans rash, accompanied by fever, fatigue, and myalgias. He was treated with a three-week course of doxycycline. With that, his rash and fever resolved, but he remained tired and achy. It is now four months out from treatment and he returns because his lingering fatigue has increased to the point that it's interfering with his life. He also reports new cognitive concerns, word searching and being slower to think on his feet. He has mood changes with pronounced irritability and he notes brief episodes of arthritic symptoms in his right knee. So this case raises the question, could this gentleman have persistent Lyme disease? Although other terms have been used to describe similar scenarios, I'll be using the term persistent Lyme disease. The three main elements of the definition are listed here. An established diagnosis of Lyme disease treated with stage appropriate antibiotic regimens, persistent manifestations that are consistent with Lyme disease, and no known reinfection or proven alternative diagnosis. The definition takes no position on the underlying pathophysiology. Potential mechanisms will be discussed later in the presentation. Other terms, including post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome and chronic Lyme disease have been used to describe patients with persistent symptoms of Lyme disease. I'll review those terms and discuss why I prefer to use persistent Lyme disease. The occurrence of persistent manifestations is well documented in the literature. Steer and colleagues identified persistent symptomatology in the early years of the disease, before therapeutic measurements were well established. But even now, we find that a substantial number of patients remain symptomatic long after therapy has ended. Alcott's 2013 study found that a third of his EM patients who were treated with 21 days of doxycycline were still symptomatic six months out from treatment. For many patients with persistent Lyme disease, their current symptoms are a continuation of their original symptoms. For others, there can be a substantial lag time. While arthritis typically occurs within months of the patient being treated for the EM rash, Steering colleagues found it could come on years later. Logigian found that peripheral nervous system symptoms developed an average of 16 months after treatment of an EM and CNS symptoms at 26 months post EM. Patients with persistent Lyme disease are a heterogeneous group and their clinical presentations are quite variable. While there are some common manifestations, there is no single disease phenotype. In individual patients, the severity and presence of symptoms often follows a waxing and waning pattern. Additionally, some symptoms may resolve and new symptoms consistent with Lyme disease may develop. Many patients with persistent symptoms have no impediments while others are disabled. Post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome, as used by Dr. John Alcott and his research colleagues at Johns Hopkins University, is also mechanistically neutral. This term is different from the earlier post-Lyme disease syndrome used in the 2006 Infectious Diseases Society of America's guidelines on Lyme disease. That term specifically implied that ongoing infection was not a possible mechanism underlying persistent symptoms. PTLDS is a research definition with strict criteria that requires functional impairment and only investigates a relatively short list of symptoms. Because of this, PTLDS only captures a subset of all patients with persistent disease. 
Yet despite those limitations, the definition allows meaningful research to go forward. In this quality of life study, there were significant differences between patients and controls with regard to symptoms. Notably, one third of the subjects had decreased vibratory sense, which is consistent with a sensory neuropathy. In this slide and the one that follows, we can examine the presence and severity of symptoms experienced by patients with PTLDS. The width of the horizontal bars correlates with the percentage of patients with a given symptom in both the PTLDS and control groups. The darkness of the color along a symptom bar signifies the intensity or severity of that particular symptom, ranging from mild in light blue, moderate, medium blue, and severe, dark blue. All of the symptoms listed showed a statistical difference between the two groups with a p-value of less than 0.05. Symptoms with asterisks had a p-value of less than 0.001. Here are the top 12 symptoms. In this cohort, fatigue is universally present. Half of the respondents rated it as severe and another 30% had moderate fatigue. In contrast, 55% of the controls reported being fatigued, but only 5% rated it as moderate and none as severe. As you scan down this list, you see the nine symptoms where the differences between the patients and controls were most impressive. Moderate to severe distal paresthesias were quite common in the patient group and goes along with the exam finding of decreased vibratory sensation. Take a moment to review this set of symptoms. Now consider this subset, photophobia, dizziness, urination changes, and nausea. Each could reflect autonomic dysfunction. Seen in this light, patients who report such symptom clusters likely have Lyme-related dysautonomia and not hypochondriasis or somatization disorder. Recall that autonomic nerve fibers run along with small sensory fibers, so it's not surprising that autonomic problems are seen in patients with peripheral neuropathies. And the various pain reports may, in some patients, reflect neuropathic pain. The International Lyme and Associated Diseases Society, ILADS for short, would say that this gentleman had chronic Lyme disease. ILADS recently published disease definition for chronic Lyme disease has two subcategories, chronic Lyme disease untreated and chronic Lyme disease previously treated. Like PTLDS, chronic Lyme disease previously treated is a research definition with strict inclusion criteria. It requires patients have multi-system symptoms that have been ongoing for six or more months following therapy and direct laboratory evidence of ongoing infection, either a positive culture or PCR for Borrelial species known to cause Lyme disease. Until we have testing that can reliably identify active infection, this disease definition has limited clinical utility. However, after presenting its disease definition, the ILADS paper details the results from its systematic review of the literature. That review identified cases meeting the criteria for chronic Lyme disease previously treated and documented the symptoms associated with those infections. Interestingly, the six most commonly reported symptoms, arthralgia, fatigue, headache, sensory changes, impaired memory, and myalgia were included in the symptom list we discussed in the previous two slides. For physicians working with Lyme disease patients, their primary goal is to prevent the disease from progressing to a chronic illness. U.S. trials on the treatment of patients with erythema migrans documented several factors that were associated with an increased likelihood of persistent Lyme disease. These included the presence of multiple erythema migrans rashes, patients whose initial presentation included neurologic symptoms, or very severe illness 
and those who remained ill at the conclusion of antibiotic therapy. The first two groups are not surprising. The presence of multiple EMs indicates that the bacteria have migrated from the tick bite site to the vasculature and then recirculated to multiple areas of the skin. Similarly, neurologic symptoms suggest dissemination to the nervous system, and it has been shown that B. burgdorferi can reach the CNS within a few days of infection. Several researchers have found that the use of corticosteroids prior to antibiotic therapy predispose patients to ongoing manifestations. And there is general agreement that patients who present with disseminated or late stage disease are more likely to have ongoing post-treatment manifestations of Lyme disease. At this point, we know the following. Persistent Lyme disease exists. The presence of specific symptoms and symptom severity varies widely and several situations can predispose patients to developing this condition. However, there are several important unknowns. Although it's often stated that 10 to 20% of patients treated for Lyme disease will have ongoing symptoms following therapy, that data is based on patients who were treated early in the infection. As noted earlier, the rate is higher when patients present with disseminated disease and antibiotic therapy is delayed. Thus, if all Lyme disease patients are included, it's likely that the incidence of persistent Lyme disease would be higher. Because we don't know the overall incidence or the natural history of persistent disease, it's impossible to estimate its prevalence. The underlying pathophysiologic mechanisms are also unknown. Potential mechanisms include immune dysregulation of many sorts, tissue injury that is either permanent or slow to heal, and persistent infection with Borrelia burgdorferi. It's certainly possible that all of these mechanisms are in play, with different mechanisms affecting different patients. And in a given patient, persistent manifestations may be fueled by more than one mechanism. Other diseases and conditions produce symptoms that overlap with those of persistent Lyme disease, and these confounders may lead to an incorrect diagnosis of persistent Lyme disease. Immune dysregulation secondary to the infection is one potential cause of ongoing manifestations. The formation of antineuronal antibodies has been identified in some patients with persistent Lyme disease. Elevations in pro-inflammatory cytokines have also been identified, suggesting that the inflammatory response may be unregulated and exaggerated. It's unknown whether this response can occur in the absence of B. burgdorferi. Tissue injury as a direct result of a B. burgdorferi infection has been documented. Invasions of neurons and glial cells can lead to cell injury and death. Muscle biopsies have demonstrated that the infection can lead to myocyte necrosis. In the case of cell death, symptoms would likely be permanent and thus inconsistent with the waxing and waning symptom pattern that some patients display. Delayed healing, on the other hand, could produce symptoms that gradually wane over time. Although persistent B. burgdorferi infection as a potential cause is quickly dismissed by many clinicians, there's substantial evidence supporting this mechanism. I'll come back to it shortly. Confounding entities, those conditions and diseases that produce symptoms similar to persistent Lyme disease, generally fall into three groups, unrelated conditions, secondary conditions, and untreated tick-borne diseases. A history of Lyme disease does not protect patients from developing other unrelated conditions. Additionally, there's a potential that Lyme disease can trigger secondary conditions. Such diagnoses must be made carefully. Although it's been suggested that certain ongoing symptoms may reflect a secondary fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue state, research has not borne this out. Wormser and colleagues found that the rate of fibromyalgia in patients with ongoing symptoms was lower than that of the general population. Schuster and colleagues could differentiate patients with persistent manifestations of Lyme disease and patients with chronic fatigue syndrome based on differences in their CSF proteins.
black legged tits can simultaneously transmit multiple pathogens. So it's possible that some patients with ongoing symptoms of Lyme disease have been adequately treated, but remain symptomatic due to the presence of an untreated tick-borne disease. Babesiosis in particular can cause chronic disease that would be unaffected by the antibiotics used to treat Lyme disease. The evidence supporting persistent infection is more substantial than you may suspect. I've included addendum slides of citations that refer to well-documented case reports of patients who received staged appropriate antibiotic therapy, yet remained ill and were subsequently culture or PCR positive for Borrelia burgdorferi. There's also evidence of persistent infection from clinical trials of both early and late disease. The animal evidence is extensive. Persistent infection has been documented in mice, hamsters, rats, guinea pigs, dogs, ponies, and non-human primates. Therapeutic exploration in animal models allows for direct tissue sampling from multiple sites of sacrificed animals, which is obviously not an option in human trials. Both Hodzik and Barthold conducted treatment trials in mice, examining therapeutic efficacy in animals infected acutely and those with late disease. In addition to a ceftriaxone arm, Barthold also studied the effectiveness of tigacycline. These studies demonstrated that ceftriaxone and tigacycline cured early disease, but that bacterial persistence was the norm in late disease. Curiously, the surviving bacteria were viable but not dividing. Hodzik subsequently reported in a 2014 paper that B. burgdorferi growth resumed after 12 months. Embers conducted two studies in non-human primates. In the first, infected monkeys with late disseminated disease were treated with a month of ceftriaxone followed by two months of doxycycline. Although all 11 animals in the treatment arm were negative on C6 ELISA testing, 73% had evidence of persistent infection at necropsy. In the sham arm, 83% were infected, but only 50% were positive on C6 testing. The second experiment examined treatment earlier in the disseminated stage of disease and it also documented negative serologic test despite persistent infection. Taken together, the two experiments demonstrate the persistence of B. burgdorferi in non-human primates despite antibiotic treatment and the absence of a positive C6 ELISA result in the face of ongoing infection. This slide in the next one reviews evidence from human trials. Three European studies demonstrated persistent B. burgdorferi infections in patients treated for erythema migrans. In these studies, pretreatment punch biopsies taken from the leading edge of EM lesions were cultured for B. burgdorferi. Patients with positive cultures had a second punch biopsy taken after antibiotic therapy. In some of these patients, cultures were repeatedly positive. In both the Sturl and Weber trials, patients who remained culture positive were retreated and recultured. The third culture was negative for all patients. The NIH conducted a xenodiagnostic study of patients with persistent Lyme disease. Its goal was to determine whether or not the method could detect evidence of ongoing B. burgdorferi infection. As depicted in the diagram, xenodiagnosis uses the tick vector to gather B. burgdorferi from the subject. This is possible because the tick saliva contains a chemoattractant that causes Borrelia to migrate from distant tissues to the bite site. Once feeding is completed, the tick can be examined for the presence of B. burgdorferi. In addition to the 10 patients who remained symptomatic following therapy and the 10 who were asymptomatic, this study also included a patient with a new erythema migrans rash to serve as a positive control 
and 10 patients with no history of Lyme disease to serve as negative controls. There were two confirmed positive PCRs. One was with the patient with the new EM rash, and the other was from a patient with ongoing systemic symptoms who had been treated 400 days earlier for Lyme arthritis. Despite claims to the contrary, it's unlikely that the positive PCR in the second patient represented bacterial debris, because a functioning immune system should have cleared such debris soon after completion of therapy. Given the evidence supporting persistent infection, it's important to consider how B. burgdorferi can persist in the face of an intact immune system and exposure to antibiotics. It turns out that bacterium has multiple mechanisms to both evade and impede the immune response. As noted here, B. burgdorferi is able to block and or inhibit both the innate and adaptive arms of the immune response. It evades the immune response by concealing or varying the appearance of surface antigens and locating to sites that are typically beyond the reach of immune cells. Emerging work on morphologic variants, biofilms, and persister cells demonstrates that under certain conditions, B. burgdorferi tolerates antibiotic exposure. A few comments regarding persister forms of B. burgdorferi. Persister cells have an innate and potentially responsive tolerance to antibiotics. Tolerance is distinctly different from antibiotic resistance, and antibiotic resistance has not been demonstrated for B. burgdorferi. Persister cells and the ability to kill them are being extensively studied by researchers at Johns Hopkins. Actively growing spiroketal forms are easiest to kill. Morphologic variants are hardest to kill, and the ease of killing the stationary growth spiroketal form falls between the two. Let's consider how we might evaluate patients for persistent Lyme disease. Because the symptoms of persistent Lyme disease overlap with those of other infections and conditions, it's important that patient evaluations be as thorough as possible. When possible, the evaluation should obtain previous records to verify the original diagnosis and treatment. Patients with persistent manifestations can be divided into two general groups. The first group are those whose initial symptoms and signs never fully cleared. Some of these may have developed additional symptoms. For this group, the primary focus is on identifying which of these possibilities account for the ongoing manifestations. Co-infections refers to other diseases transmitted by black legged ticks. The second group consists of those whose symptoms initially resolved with therapy only to return at a later date. The differential diagnosis for this group includes reinfections, the entities considered for group one, and a long list of other potential diagnoses. Regardless of which group a patient may fall into, as you conduct your evaluation, it's important to bear in mind that persistent Lyme disease can exist in the presence of other illnesses and conditions. Patients in the group with relapsing symptoms have an expanded differential diagnosis list. This table includes entities that merit consideration, but it isn't an exhaustive listing. While the history and or exam can rule out many of these, it may be necessary to conduct disease-specific diagnostic testing. History taking should begin with a detailed interval history for all. The possibility of reinfection should be explored in patients who recovered but subsequently relapsed. The presence and severity of Lyme-compatible symptoms should be assessed. Ask about the 25 symptoms from the PTLDS study that were more frequent in patients with persistent symptoms than healthy controls. Patients with a history of a known co-infection should be asked about the treatment they received and their response to it. Those with no co-infection history should be questioned regarding the signs and symptoms of these infections on the chance that this might uncover a previously missed infection. Given the multisystemic nature of persistent Lyme disease, 
the history should also investigate the possibility of diseases and conditions that present with extensive symptomatology. Examples include endocrine dysfunction, malignancy, and systemic inflammatory processes. All patients require a good general exam with a focus on the neurologic, musculoskeletal, and dermatologic exams. The neurologic exam should be especially detailed in order to assess patients for peripheral and autonomic neuropathies, cognitive impairments, and cerebellar dysfunction. The musculoskeletal exam looks for joint pain, range of motion, inflammatory changes, and joint damage. Muscles should be examined for bulk, tenderness, stiffness, and weakness. Potential dermatologic findings include recurrent erythema migrans rashes, acrodermatitis chronica atrophicans, that's the discolored tissue paper fine skin that is often found on the dorsum of the feet and hands. Although this finding is more common in Europe than in the US, its presence in any patient suggests ongoing infection. Symptom-driven exams may also be necessary. For example, cardiac function may need to be assessed in patients who report significant palpitations, exercise intolerance, or dependent edema. All patients should be tested for other potential black-legged tick transmitted diseases, especially those that are not susceptible to previous antibiotic therapy. A CBC with differential, SED rate, C-reactive protein, and a comprehensive metabolic panel should be obtained. Because fatigue is an almost universal complaint, thyroid studies should be done. Additional blood work and other testing modalities are more patient-specific, based on an individual's symptoms and signs. For example, EMGs and nerve conduction studies for patients with peripheral neuropathy symptoms, autonomic testing for orthostatic symptoms, neuropsychometric testing to follow up on cognitive concerns. Synovial fluid and tissue sampling may be helpful. Looking for non-tick-borne infections is also important. Consider testing for Moicoplasma pneumoniae and Chlamydia pneumoniae, as well as Epstein-Barr virus and Cytomegalovirus. Serologic testing following antibiotic interventions is not helpful for ruling persistent Lyme disease in or out. Because antibody levels decline following therapy, regardless of clinical outcome, negative results are not indicative of cure. The duration of elevated antibody levels varies significantly from individual to individual. Thus, positive results are not indicative of ongoing infection. Getting back to our case discussion, at four months, our 50-year-old patient complained of fatigue, irritability, cognitive concerns, and pain and swelling in the right knee. His exam was notable for a flat affect and small effusion of the right knee. His Beck inventory score indicated a normal mood. His thyroid studies were abnormal, leading to a diagnosis of hypothyroidism and replacement therapy. He returned two months later with worsening fatigue, cognitive impairments, and irritability. His wife reported he was hard to live with. Repeat thyroid studies were normal and other diagnoses were excluded. Based on his persistent manifestations in the absence of an alternative diagnosis, he was diagnosed with persistent Lyme disease and hypothyroidism. Under these circumstances, is persistent Lyme disease a reasonable diagnosis? Like other diagnoses which lack definitive testing, Persistent Lyme disease is often a best fit diagnosis. When history and exam align with the diagnosis and exploration of other diagnoses has been unrevealing, the likelihood of persistent Lyme disease increases. A positive response to empiric treatment would provide additional support for the diagnosis. Earlier in this presentation, I noted that there were several areas of uncertainty with regard to persistent Lyme disease, perhaps the greatest being how to treat patients with this illness.
Treatment for confounding infections and conditions is relatively straightforward. Patients with conditions secondary to or unrelated to Lyme disease should receive condition-directed therapies. Patients with untreated tick-transmitted infections should be treated with appropriate antibiotic regimens. In either situation, patients should be reassessed following therapeutic intervention in order to verify that their symptoms have responded to therapy. With regard to our discussion case, treatment for hypothyroidism normalized his thyroid studies but failed to resolve his symptoms. This is an example of persistent Lyme disease coexisting with an unrelated condition, and clinicians should be mindful of this possibility. When ongoing manifestations are due to persistent Lyme disease, treatment should be directed towards the perceived underlying pathophysiology. Therapies directed at tissue injury are generally supportive in nature. For example, patients with neuropathic pain may benefit from gabapentin or pregabulin, and patients with new onset strabismus may require eyeglasses with prisms. Case reports have documented the successful use of IVIG for persistent post-antibiotic neuropathies. Given the well-documented elevations in inflammatory cytokines seen in some patients, there may be a role for other types of immunomodulation, but clinical investigations have yet to be done. Antibiotic retreatment targeting a presumed ongoing B. burgdorferi infection was found to be useful by investigators who were studying the treatment of erythema migrans and chronic Lyme encephalopathy. Widespread clinical reports also documented improved outcomes following antibiotic retreatment. In some of the EM trials, subjects who failed initial therapy subsequently improved after receiving an additional course of an oral antibiotic or IV ceftriaxone. In the encephalopathy trial, a patient who relapsed had complete response to a second 30-day course of ceftriaxone. Others have reported successful outcomes from retreatment with both oral and IV agents. Five formal trials of antibiotic retreatment have been completed. Four NIH-sponsored trials in the U.S. and another conducted in the Netherlands. The enrolled patients had several common manifestations that often severely impacted their quality of life. The U.S. patients, like the gentleman in our case study, did not have significant psychopathology to account for their symptoms. Despite the informal observations that antibiotic retreatment can be helpful, the underlying question remains, is it effective? The most commonly held position, based on the Klempner and Berendi studies, is that antibiotic retreatment is not helpful because none of the three trials demonstrated therapeutic efficacy. However, each of these small trials had significant design flaws that allowed for the recruitment of a very heterogeneous patient population. Under such circumstances, it's difficult to find a meaningful treatment effect without having a much larger sample size. Bottom line, these trials are uninformative. A closer look at the Krupp and Fallon trials suggests that retreatment is beneficial for some. Considering only those patients with persistent and severe fatigue, both investigators found a moderate to large treatment effect. The Krupp study was specifically designed to look at fatigue, and there was a marked difference in outcome between the treatment and placebo arms. The Fallon trial had fatigue as a secondary endpoint. When Fallon looked at his subjects who satisfied the Krupp entrance criteria, he found a similar treatment effect. Unfortunately, because these were very small trials with strict enrollment criteria, the findings may not be applicable to a community population. By the way, the citations on this slide provide rigorous critiques of the NIH studies. Some have pointed to the fact that neither Krupp nor Fallon recommended retreatment across the board 
as a way to discredit that therapeutic approach. While it's true that significant adverse events associated with IV ceftriaxone kept Krupp and Fallon from making a broad recommendations for its use in retreatment, the severity of the ongoing illnesses and the improvement in fatigue prompted them to recommend additional trials with agents that are safer and less costly. In his 2012 review of the four NIH trials, Fallon made the case for considering antibiotic retreatment on an individualized basis. There are other reports in the literature regarding retreatment. Patients with Lyme arthritis who fail to respond on an initial trial of oral agents are often given a second month of an oral antibiotic and when needed, a third month using IV ceftriaxone. Case reports document the successful use of disulfiram for persistent fatigue and neurocognitive deficits. Danta and Horowitz have published their experiences with combination therapy. Evidence from a mouse model of persistent Lyme disease caused by Bieberdorferi persister cells built on the investigators in vitro work that suggested the need for combination therapy. In this study, mice were infected for one week, divided into various treatment arms, sacrificed at eight weeks, and examined for the presence of ongoing infection. Here, the investigators found that only the combination of doxycycline, ceftriaxone, and daptomycin completely eradicated the microcolony persister form. So how might clinicians deal with this significant therapeutic uncertainty? We should acknowledge that patients who are ill today can't wait for tomorrow's research and that they have the right to make decisions on their own behalf. And although it's true that physicians should avoid harming patients, concern over potential harm has to be balanced against the harms associated with doing nothing. Shared decision-making is especially well-suited for this situation. In this model, physicians lay out the risks and benefits of different treatment options, including not treating. Here, patient values, goals, and willingness to assume various degrees of risk are critical to determining a course of action. Evidence-based medicine and shared decision-making are linked. Evidence-based medicine is more than research findings. It's the integration of trial evidence, clinical expertise, and patient values. This integration is dynamic such that the relative weight of each element is situational. When the research evidence is of high quality, clinical expertise and patient values carry less weight as these are likely to align with the trial findings and conclusions. But when the evidence is of low quality, clinician expertise and patient values become increasingly important. Treatment decisions are also subject to ethical considerations. Physicians are ethically bound to put patient needs ahead of their own and ahead of the interests of third-party entities such as medical societies, credentialing organizations, payers, and employers. And while physicians are free to choose whom they serve, they are obligated to respect the rights of patients and their colleagues. Taking these principles as a whole, clinicians may choose to not treat patients with persistent Lyme disease, but they should not act as an obstacle to the patient obtaining care from a colleague who is willing to treat. To summarize, some patients who are treated for Lyme disease will develop persistent manifestations of the illness. The diagnosis of persistent Lyme disease is based on clinical judgment that weighs historical, exam, and diagnostic evidence. There are several potential pathophysiologic mechanisms, but we lack readily available diagnostic testing. Antibiotic retreatment aimed at eliminating a persistent B. burgdorferi infection has been beneficial for some. And given the significant scientific uncertainties, clinicians and patients should utilize shared decision-making to arrive at patient-specific 
therapeutic programs. Thank you for participating in the CME activity, Persistent Lyme Disease.